So I'm going to hand you over to Dave and Dom. They're going to break a song down for you and give you some insight into how they put things together. And then we'll open up for a Q&A. Is that okay with you guys? Are you still here? Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, guys. Uh, bef before we talk about this, I want to talk. This has always amazed me. I mean, you must have had this case like for years. <laughs> this is their flag case. <laughs> okay, this is African style. Yeah. So all this just f is this yours? Yeah, that's mine. This so it just fits in there. This piece of foam, it was cut out and everything stuck in it, and it goes in there. So when you arrive at hotels, they think you're a, being a lady with all this luggage. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Do you know what we, we discovered was being a civilian as much as possible just saved us a lot of hassle, especially when you're at airports. When yeah. you fly a lot, as soon as you've got a flight case, you can just, especially when you're flying in the US, the TSA will have you straight away. You will never see your gear ever again. And uh, you, we just found that um, you know, we were losing stuff left, right, and center. It was big, it was heavy, it didn't have wheels, and uh, it just it was, it was arriving like sort of every second time. And we thought, oh, how can we change this? And we just decided... Let's go light, obviously, because we have to pick the things up. I and mean, we had like 24, 25, 28 kilogram bags. Dom used to have this monstrous flight case. And uh, we were eventually like, no ways, man. <laughs> this is too much hassle. So, yeah, yeah this, put it this fits into a snowboard case. And uh, yeah, it just, it just simplifies everything. Um, that's kind of what you want when you're on the road. As proof of what we were saying, this is a little letter from the German uh, uh, sort of security people. And this is one from the Americans saying that we well, looked at your bag just to check what is inside it. Anyway. Yeah, the Italians just break it open. They're probably the, the least nice about it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really important, you know, especially when you're doing long haul flights to keep things as compact as possible. Um, obviously, you get to a stage where, you know, you can also hi hire an extra gear while you're touring. But I, lo I love this setup and I've, you know, I, I must take my hat off you guys for being innovative. Um, and these are killer bags, by the way. If you want yeah. an awesome bag to like fit things in, you can fit lots of six packs in there. <laughs> yeah, UDG <laughs> make amazing yeah. stuff. <laughs> this is six packs. Huh? Crazy. So, um, break this down. Take turns. Talk about how these it okay. all fits together, and, okay. for, and just maybe you could give us the base of where everything's coming from. Okay. So basically, Ableton Live is the heartbeat of what we do. Um, when we first started, we used to be a lot more mechanical and uh, hardware orientated. I still actually use the MC909. We used to sequence everything live off this back in the day, which is quite a, a dinosaur way of working, but it just allowed us to have that real hands-on approach to what we were doing. But what we were finding was that it just, you know, it's very raw, so you weren't really being able to, comp you know, when we, the first year we went to Ibiza and played at Pasha, you know, our stuff wasn't mastered. You're, you're competing against DJs with, you know, just this huge master track. And uh, so, you know, that wasn't really possible for us to do without, you know, traveling with outboard outboard compressors and all that kind of stuff which is just it's just not worth it because you know the other side of it is is what we would like to do as opposed to what an audience can actually understand or actually care about um, are two different things uh, so we moved over to Ableton Live and obviously that gave us a huge amount of flexibility um, obviously having an Apple Mac Book Pro makes a huge difference these got SSD hard drives uh, which makes a big difference as well yeah, I mean that's kind of where it's that's kind of where like the track, let's call it the back track, kind of originates from there. Ableton Live, it's running uh, via USB into this uh, Ellen Heath mixer, which is a it's a sound card mixer with effects on it. Um, and then uh, the controllers for Ableton Live, I've got um, I'm using a the iPad app called Touchable. You can see there's all my songs. We were using uh, we've got the APC40 and the uh, the Novation, Novation launch pad and that. But the, the problem was is that it's kind of critical when you're on, in the heat of battle on stage that you don't press the wrong button. <laughs> and these things are labeled, so it's quite hard to press the wrong button. So that's pretty cool. Um, it runs over Wi-Fi. I've got a little Wi-Fi access point here. So it sits in my bag. Um, and that guarantees us having strong, powerful Wi-Fi wherever we go in the world. Because, you know, you go to venues and there generally is Wi-Fi there. But once there's you know, a few thousand people in a venue, that Wi-Fi source can be quite tricky to actually <laughs> run yeah. critical information over. So we just travel their own Wi-Fi router. That yeah. makes a huge difference. And then I've got this little, very sandy, thanks to Rockin' the Daisies, little nano controller. Um, it's kind of small and fiddly, but it's really light. It's very reliable. And, you know, I like to have a button where if I push it up, something happens. If I pull it down, something happens. And uh, you don't really get that from the controllers because they... You know, A, it's a touch screen, so it, you can't just sort of, while you're playing the saxophone, sort of blindly grab at something and know yeah. what it is. It's kind of hard to do that with a touch screen, so that's kind of why I got this little guy. It's also running USB into there. Um, and then... Um, cool Chaos Pad. 
Then I've got the Chaos Pad 3 running here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For that sort of, just to add chaos. <laughs> you know, it kind of helps with when we're doing build-ups and we're like messing around live and we, you know, if, if uh, we're just cutting in the middle of a track and, and uh, looping things, then, uh, and we want to do a, create some sort of like tension and drama that this is kind of like, and obviously there's more things to it than that. You can do live looping on it, which is really awesome. And uh, Dave, sometimes you, you'll sample your voice and you know, it's kind of a cool thing to do. You'll be sort of saying how's it to the crowd and you can <laughs> sample yourself and, and then loop your voice and bring it into the track. Um, and then uh, oh, yeah. we've got a Roland SP, what's that? That's just a sampler basically. It's a hardware sampler, I don't know if you can, you can see it on the screen there. Uh, it's the sort of, there we go, points. It's just, <laughs> I've got some acapellas on it. I've got some, some percussion loops. Uh, I've got some backup tracks, always very important. Always very useful when Ableton decides to do something naughty. And uh, so that helps. Uh, and then what else we got here? I actually just got this recently. This is the Synth Station 49. It's quite a cool keyboard. The main thing about what I like about it is that this will fit into a Samsonite suitcase, just, <laughs> but still give me 49 keys. If you're a keyboard player, you'll know that like only having two octaves can get a bit irritating. And what's also quite cool about it is that I can run apps on it. So, uh, you know, you plug your iPad in and I've got uh, the Moog, the Mini Moog uh, map, uh, app they've got there. We've got uh, a piano app and you can switch between those. Plus, uh, then that gets run into the MC909 which is sounding a little temperamental today. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you can run the audio through that and then adjust, the f adjust what my stereo where's send fancy, is to... Where's that fancy little box that we had to order with great, uh, at great expense? Yeah. So that the two could the other tricky other. thing is, um, you know, with the constant evolution of technology, uh, you know, all the new keyboards are just running USB MIDI out. So now old gear doesn't do that anymore. They only have, you know, MIDI DIN. So I had to get a special controller which could convert you know, the iPad and the, the MIDI on and, no, on and off notes uh, to something that this could recognize. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. And then we've got some samples and obviously all the instruments load onto there as well. So, I mean, basically how we, 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 we evolved from having like all our separate tracks running off the 909, uh, running into a much bigger desk and having like this huge amount of control, which was, which was amazing. And we actually came up with a lot of songs on the fly and new things, and and it was hugely stressful, and kind of uh, it it didn't always like Dom said, didn't always work out from a sonic point of view. Um, so we, we your monitoring would have to be just so perfect yeah. so you could actually hear what the crowd was hearing. We slowly we slowly switched over onto we we first ran with Ableton and that, and then as we got a little bit better at producing dance tracks, which just took us a while, <laughs> 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 as a a friend, Dave Mack, down, sitting down there, told us once about our first album. He's like, hmm, this sounds like dance music made by musicians. <laughs> 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 which, was, which was very true. He was a very wise man back then. He still is now. Um, anyway, so the, the, kind of the way we, we went about that is we, we do a lot of pre-production on our tracks. And then we also, um, we also have like looped sections of the full track. So before we were running like a you know, like a whole row of, of different channels which we could bring in and out. And we found that that, that kind of control wasn't actually that great. It was a little bit distracting, And actually. it was kind of distracting, and you ended up doing a lot of things that you didn't have to. And, we've, and, it, and it distracted from the main thing which we do is play instruments. And we discovered, after a while, that that's what people wanted to see us play. They were like, we wanted to see you play the saxophone or the flute or the double bass and, the, and obviously because that's not what everyone does so it kind of makes sense eventually but you don't always see that straight away when, you, when you're so close to something. Um, no, and I think it's important, the performance aspect. You know, a exactly. lot of people get stuck behind the gear and get so focused on the gear forgetting that there's actually an audience out there that want to see interaction yeah. and movement. We always, yeah. Yeah, we always wanted to bring that live element to dance music, you know, just about the collision of the analog and digital, the human element is what makes makes it come alive it's like sushi it's, it's it, it comes alive with uh, a bit of wasabi is is there a reason why you have the keyboard like that definitely you don't get like rsi from um, it or anything actually this table's a bit high but normally what what makes it quite useful is when you get onto uh, dj tables where it's a bit low it allows me i'm quite a tall guy um to have the natural you know height that i'd like also obviously you can see what i'm doing once again before when i had it flat the comment i got the most was i can't see what you're doing you know and that 
that kind of defeats the object. You want people to see that, oh my goodness, you know, this is actually being sent through. That's a really, really good idea. Um, we're going to take some questions uh, in the spirit of this part of the workshop, if you could maybe keep them technical, uh, and the guys will answer. There should be a roaming mic somewhere. Has anyone got any questions? Okay, fine, we'll move on. <laughs> Come on. How many brains are in here? There, there's one question. There's a mic over here. Okay, we have our first question. Do you actually produce on stage, or do you preset your like kind of rhythms to like play on stage when you have a live gig, or do you just improv it? Okay, well, it's it's kind of a balance between both. So, like I was saying before, we produce we produce our tracks for live, specifically for live. You know, like the track we just played now, it's like it's got that big drop out, bang, and we start playing the saxophone now. That first came about with us. I used actually to manually do it. We used to jam it, and like so, that was pretty cool that we came up with a lot of those ideas like that. Um, now it's the, the new challenge has been to actually is to rem like do those things without that control. You know, the happy balance of the fact that between the two of us, we've only got four hands, and a lot of the time they're being occupied by the instrument we're playing. So there's certain things you can and can't do. You know, and you I mean, this you could do more, um, but you also want to be you don't want to be you know, just totally wrapped up in what you're doing here. I mean, there also has to be it some sort of It is at the end of the projection. day a performance. It is a performance. It's not a, we're not going on, the people aren't coming on, st come to watch us, to watch us produce be music. Because that's l pretty boring, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but having said that, we, we thrive on the live energy of what we do and, and uh, how we, and how we kind of get around that is, is have a lot of like, you know, looped sections of the tracks that we've done or, so that we can, you know, if the if the mood strikes, or let's say Dom starts playing something on the keyboard, that is just really like ripping it hard, and uh, and it's just really getting a vibe going, and then it's like, oh, we don't want to finish this song, you know, we want to keep it going, and then we can loop that section. It's pretty pretty quick and easy, and uh, and from there we can start developing and add more, you know, maybe oh wrong song, maybe add in some percussion and and just start building things, and you know Dom can keep a you know loop going, and then we can. We could maybe bring in a, a keyboard loop that he's been playing and loop it and... and uh a lot of our songs have actually developed like that. Um, new songs have actually developed out of, out of play, a play-out section of an old track um, that we'll be playing, or an existing track. And, uh, you know, Dave will look at me while I'm doing something and be like, that's, that's something. Um, don't forget that, which I then invariably do. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> uh, if I remember it again, then you know it, that it's hopefully going to stick. And, uh, you know, a lot of our songs have come, up, come about that way. Cool. cool. Any more Thank questions? There's one over there. Oh, there's one there, sorry. You're my blind spot. <laughs> so just to we'll expand a little bit more on that. Um, stand, stand up for us, please. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Otherwise we can't see you. There we go. Cool. Um, you said that sometimes, you know, you, you use those looping sections to develop and maybe carry on a couple of ideas and do that kind of stuff. So is that only in pre-planned, like over here, you know, we're going to go into the next tune, so we're going to have a, a pre-planned looping section, which we may or may not use, or is it like in the moment you can trigger that loop? Yeah, you can like move it anyway. Both, to be honest. Yeah. I've, got, I've pretty much got loops on, on almost every track sort of near the end, because obviously the playouts of dance tracks are generally kind of a bit sparser. They don't have all the top end, because obviously for what we are doing in generally is melodic top end kind of stuff, bas bar the bass, although the the bass is sometimes. Um, so in, this, in those kind of sparser sections, it, it gives us the freedom to kind of to open up and, and start laying in new creative ideas and, and layering them on top of each other. And, and then, you know, I've also got a whole bunch of loops sitting in Ableton as well, just sort of spin around like we do in the studio. We're like, oh, this is a great loop. Let's remember that one and put it in a folder. And we did the same thing with Ableton. You just can drop them all in there and, and just have them for maybe one day a lot of them just never get used, but then one day it'll be like, <laughs> Cool. Cool. Uh, there's a question over here. There's two here. Okay. Um, just before we get the question, so when, you, when you, you obviously write the track in the studio, and then you go like, wow, this should be a track, and then you pull all the gear out in the studio and then figure out how you're going to play and what, where you're going to we use the gear and how you're going to integrate it. How does that happen? Well, the, the beauty of Ableton is just how it's just so jammable. It's so, you know, it's, we can grab and it's, you know, you can literally drag anything in, get it beat matched almost instantly and, and uh, you know, just start experimenting. It's kind of like music Lego. You can just get in there and, you know, start building something straight um, away. If I turn this little guy around, um, 
I'm just going to unplug it quickly so you can see. You can, you know, I mean, I don't know how many of you guys actually have Ableton or use it, right? But there's two kind of views that you can use in Ableton. Now, this is the cell, okay. cell view. This is the cell view, as it's, you know, this little cells. Let's call them cells. <laughs> And uh, you can basically trigger them. Now, when, we, when we're in the studio, we are working in this view in the creation phase, mostly. So we'll be jamming this kind of thing, working on bass lines and loops and, and drum beats and all sorts of other ideas. And then, right, so then you, you get into the session view, which is more looks more like logic and that kind of thing. And, that's, and what we normally do is we'll take it from the cell view and we'll jam it into the other view, because you can actually record what you do in this view, and it lays it out in the other view. I need another finger down there. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's super cool, because we, a lot of the times we come up, oh, I lost the button. We come up with, this, with like, sort of ideas and ways of doing things that we wouldn't have done if we were sitting there going, oh, let's put, yeah. a, let's put that block there. Because it's kind of like Lego. Yeah. It's not particularly creative. And it's more fun to just jam, and we've got an APC 40 right there in the middle of the studio. It's kind of like the, the center, and you can literally do anything to anything with that thing. Cool. Let's take this question, question over here. Yeah, cool. I want to just focus on like, your master channel when you guys play live. Do you have any like, mastering you know, plugins and stuff like that running on the mastering channels at all during your live, on the master channel no. during your live performances? Nothing. No. Um, another thing we do, which we didn't mention before, is uh, the, you know, uh, we recently started doing this actually for a show we did at the Heineken Music Hall in Amsterdam last year. Was it last year? This year. And uh, I'll show you again. Um, basically, you know, when, when you're on those big festivals, you sometimes watch some of those big artists and uh, you're trying to figure out how they are possibly syncing their visuals and uh, lighting so perfectly with their music. And sometimes they've got a really shit hot lighting engineer and sometimes uh, they don't. And obviously, when there's just the two of us traveling around the world, we've got to try and figure out ways of making our show as impactful as possible. So, first, you want a big stage with big production, lighting, or a big festival. video walls. Um, yeah. And you know, we'd get to a festival or a thing, and there'd be you know just some random sound engineer or lighting engineer or video engineer who you would give a hard disk of your you know your visuals or your lighting and go, uh, here you go, and you basically at his mercy. Um, and we wanted to really avoid doing that as much as we could. So we devised a plan of actually pre-programming all our video and lights over Wi-Fi using MIDI and sending that via over Wi-Fi to front of house and then triggering the lighting off a special desk, which is called a Grand MA, I think Grand it's MA, called. Yeah. I'm not the lighting guy. Anyway, so we spent a couple of months actually pre-programming every single song we have with MIDI cue notes so that you know, when a drop comes in, the lights actually go on at the right time the correct visual comes in, the lyrics of the song, or whatever it is. Um, some people don't do it that way. Some people possibly just do it as a pre-programmed set from front of house, which is something we don't really agree with and we wouldn't want to do. But you know, at the end of the day, it's a show and whatever works for you. OK, there's another question here. Do you want to stand up, please? Um, with your, with your, when you're playing live and that, you know you have the goldfish sound and that. And I saw you were going crazy there for a bit. Um, how much emphasis do you put on when you play um, in certain keys and that in your songs? Like I as Goldfish, like do you guys have a specific um, range of keys that you like to use to create a certain vibe? And you mean keys as in, as in as in actually the keyboard or on the bass or anything like? Is there a specific like how much emphasis do you put on? Depends on the song, I think. Um, sometimes the most important thing is when knowing not when knowing when to not play. You know, just because you're a musician and you and you you know you spend all this time studying music, you know the the beauty of dance music can just be the the power of uh, you know just of something simple repeated, and uh, you know kind of leaving your ego at the door of of not trying to be this virtuoso, you know, and actually just trying to get down to the essence of the music is actually sometimes the hardest thing to do. Cool. I think we've got time for one more question. We'll take we'll take one here and the one at the back, and then we're gonna have to wrap it up. Um, do you guys work oftentimes with more than just yourself? I know you have a vocalist, I know Emily sings with you, and, and you've had a couple of other people. How does the communication on stage work then, adding another person into the mix and looping sections, and you go like, sing now, you know? Well, yeah. Yeah, well, we, we know obviously when we've got a singer on board, it's, a, it's another sort of kettle of fish altogether. No, you, you have to treat them gently. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they can't read our minds, firstly. Me and Dom have got a fairly good sort of mind reading thing going, but. 
you know, when it comes to another singer, we kind of had to stick to certain, like, pre pre destined ideas, obviously. Okay, so you kind of run the track from, from one point to one point and you know that's how you do it every time and then it, after that yeah. you have a little bit of a... You only have, obviously we try and put cue points in for them so that if we are messing around, because a lot of the time we okay. are, you know, part of what we do is messing around, so we'll be messing around at the end of the one song going into the next and it's or kind of... the beginning of a, of yeah, a new song. You've got to know, you, you got to let, they've got to know when their time is to go, okay, I'm coming in four bars time, you know, so there's either like a so we put like either you know we'll put some sort of little sort of subliminal thing like in there a reverse symbol into a crash or something and it'll say okay listen okay, to this can. this is your cue it's four bars coming when you hear that and you're on a big stage you've got to know <laughs> you've got to be on stage yeah. <laughs> luckily a lot of the singers we work with are ninjas as well so they know how to yeah. you know go with us follow with us okay, and you cool. put a lot of rehearsal time into that obviously I mean before you thought <laughs> no yeah really. I, I'm Sometimes, sometimes it's actually nice to just sort of throw people in the deep end and, and, and just see what happens. <laughs> Spontaneity. Cool, thank you. One more question at the back, and then we will wrap this part of the session up. Uh, my name is Dandako, and I um, love your music, man. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Great music. Um, the one thing that you said, you said that you guys are jazz musicians, you're live musicians, um, and uh, I'm, I'm a vocalist. I'm a, and uh, can we jam? Can we jam? Can we do like a one minute jam? Now. Now. <laughs> okay, let's bring you it up. You've got 60 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> but you have to come here. Come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. An opportunist, yeah. I like it. Right, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. <laughs> No pressure, guys. I know you're pros. Uh, yeah. uh, main <laughs> master volume. <laughs> Always a good thing to start <laughs> with. <laughs> Just let the music play and let it groove. Music play and let it groove. Just let the music play and let it groove. Music play. Da 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 do 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 Listen to the good music, put it, put it, and listen to the good. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was very special. There's a saying in this industry. 80% will and 20% skill. I'm not saying you only have 20% skill, but that's will coming through, yeah? You have to be driven. So thank you for that spontaneity. Guys, ma massive thank you uh, to Goldfish for coming down. Uh, big up to you guys. Respect. Thank you. Give them a massive round of applause for these people.